Adams. I'd like to introduce uh, Carolyn Murray, who will introduce the speakers. Good afternoon, everybody. Great to be back in person with those of you that are here. And um, I want to tell you just a teeny bit about Moss Adams before I introduce our speakers. Um, I think many of you have heard our name by now, but I don't know how many of you all know much about us. Um, so Moss Adams is a 108-year-old public accounting firm, top 10 um, in the country as far as size, with over 3,400 professionals uh, that provide audit, tax, and all kinds of advisory. And we're going to hear from our speakers a little bit about ESG, which is one of our advisory services. Um, if you might wonder, okay, if we're 108 years, years old, how don't you know about us, if you don't already? Um, and that we're a West Coast firm headquartered in Seattle, and we've been here in Texas for about six years now. So um, I think most of you have met me by now, but uh, you'll get to meet a couple of my colleagues here shortly. So um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the two colleagues who have come here from Seattle today uh, to be in person with us, Lori Tisch and Trisha Bensich. Lori is the National Practice Leader for Government Services for Moss Adams and also specializes in providing services in the Environmental Social Governance or ESG arena. In that role, she's responsible for auditing and verifying corporate sustainability reports and assisting companies in developing ESG standards and processes. Her focus areas include social and personnel matters, board governance, food and beverage supply chain and production, internal controls and reporting of relevant data and greenhouse gas emissions. Lori is a nationally recognized speaker on topics including ESG matters, corporate sustainability and reporting, government accounting and auditing standards, federal compliance, and corporate governance. Lori is the immediate past chair of the board of directors of the National Association of the State Board of Accountancy, or NASBA, and has served on numerous AICPA and accounting and auditing standard setting committees. Also joining us today is Trisha Bensich. Trisha is the Inclusion and Social Responsibility Associate Director at Moss Adams, with over 20 years of experience in the public accounting field. In her role, she collaborates with leaders across the firm to develop and implement strategies to foster an inclusive culture and increase engagement in our communities. She also leads the firm's performance management and continuous listening efforts. Trisha sits on the Youth Force Board, a nonprofit organization focused on helping underserved teens find leadership and career opportunities through mentored internship programs. Trisha graduated from Marquette University with a Bachelor of Science degree with a major in Human Resources Management. So without further ado, please welcome Lori and Tish, Trisha. Thanks, Carolyn. Well, thank you for having us here today. Uh, this is one of my favorite topics. I love talking about ESG and corporate sustainability reports. And we're pleased to be here in Dallas. I have to say, uh, Carolyn mentioned I'm the immediate past chair of NASBA, the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy. And I took office uh, right before the pandemic hit. So my year of traveling around the country, plus some foreign locations to be a speaker at many, many events, became me in my small home office talking into my laptop computer camera for a year. So I am thrilled to be here in person in front of a live studio audience. Thank you. <laughs> it's been a long 18 months, and I know we're not out of the woods yet, but it's so nice to be having some of these events back in person again. Okay, well, today's topic, uh, environmental social governance reporting and the role of assurance. We're going to cover a little bit of the history and background of what ESG is, some of the benefits, some of the challenges. Tricia is going to then cover some of the difficulties, so we say challenges, in pulling together a company's ESG report. And then I'll take it back over and spend a little bit of time on how those reports can be verified or audited. 
We will have plenty of time for questions at the end. Uh, and Tricia and I will be staying for the reception right after this event. So if we, you have other questions or would like to pull us aside, we'll definitely be here for that. So what is ESG? And I know that a lot of you are very familiar with the term, but I am gonna give you a little bit of, of background that maybe you're not familiar with. In today's nomenclature, it is a term used, especially in the capital markets, used by investors and stakeholders to evaluate corporate behavior, not only in the environment, but also how they treat their people and their stakeholders, and also the governance function, the board of directors, the senior executives. It refers to a set of criteria that are standards for a company's operations, um, particularly that with, again, that eye toward that socially conscious investor. We like to say that it is a way to create more value for your company by having less impact on the environment. And you can see the recent quote from the Financial Times. It really has become a new measure of success for corporations, not-for-profits, governmental entities, and countries alike. Now, when we talk about the environment, that is all-encompassing. That is covering a lot of ground. Uh, but in general, it's going to consider how that company performs as far as being a steward of resources and nature and the global environment and the impact that they have on that environment. The social criteria, as I mentioned, is really how you manage your employees. Your, and it's not just internal, but it's also your suppliers, your customers, and even the entire community that you're based in or that you serve. And as I mentioned, governance is really how the company is managed. How is the board of directors uh, comprised? What are their actions? What do they care about? What are the actions of senior executives? Now, in previous times, ESG is a fairly new term. We really used the term corporate social responsibility, or CSR. That has really morphed and evolved into ESG, but it's still a common term, and it is a concept where, again, the organization considers the interests of society by taking responsibility for their impact and their actions. Sustainability reporting is the disclosure and the commitment that you're going to make to your stakeholders about ESG and corporate social responsibility matters. In this talk today, Tricia and I will be interchanging ESG, CSR, and sustainability reporting to a certain degree. They, they mean slightly different things in different contexts, but for days, today's talk, uh, they will be somewhat used interchangeably. Typically, the reports that a company issues covering the ESG topics are often referred to as the corporate social responsibility report or a sustainability report. Now, I know a lot of you already know this, but I want to um, just emphasize that there are a number of reasons why ESG reporting is becoming more and more important. Customers care. They are factoring these, the disclosures that your companies make into their decisions whether to use your company or not. Employees and your recruits are definitely placing importance on this. There's also a lot of stakeholder pressure, particularly amongst the investor community, to be transparent about your supply chain, your labor standards, and your inclusion and diversity efforts as a company. The financial side, there can be cost savings. There can be cost burdens for this, no doubt, but there can also be some cost savings. And there's also tax credits available for a number of programs that you can embark into. And of course, if you don't wanna do it voluntarily, there's always the regulatory compliance. I will hit on that in a little bit on how some of the states and the federal government are starting to force compliance. I think one of the more intrinsic benefits that are, is very important is this really a way to establish your brand and tell your company's story. 
use it to your advantage. This is important to your stakeholders. And so what I see a lot amongst my clients that engage in putting out the ESG reports, they're really using this also as a marketing tool, as a way to just really tell their story in a positive way. And you can truly be seen as an industry leader if you're out in front doing these things. Consumers are very interested in ESG. They're starting to base their purchasing decisions on how a company is disclosing or not disclosing their impacts. Um, the way that uh, food and beverage especially is packaged is becoming important. And local sourcing of ingredients, buying local, which then cuts down on carbon emissions, for example, is very important to consumers. And in general, we see retailers of all stripes and sort starting to green their supply chains or making sure that the, the companies in their supply chain are doing that right thing, or at least are putting out a transparent document that shows their impact. In a recent consumer report survey, this shows what the consumers were looking for. Now, um, I can be cynical sometimes because I'm in the business of auditing these reports. And I'm here to tell you when somebody says that they are natural or organic or even locally grown, there's not a lot of set of criteria that you can measure that against. And so a lot of times these terms get used, uh, let's say they're used and abused. They sometimes are exaggerated. So we get, I, I certainly get very cynical when I see certain reports uh, when they're not audited. I'll give you a, a story from, it's been a number of years now, but one of my clients uses organic bananas in one of their products. And there was a year where there was a, a pest and some weather problems, and it really wiped out the entire crop in the world of organic grown bananas. So we were dealing with that with the client and the disclosures, which were somewhat disappointing because they weren't able to meet their goals. Well, I went into a grocery store near my home that's well known for organic and natural products, and they had a huge display of organic bananas. And I was just, okay, where did they get these? Because I know that these are not able to be sourced right now. So I, I tell you, there's just a lot of, um, claims and, and labels, and although they're important to consumers, uh, until they're verified or assured, it is, uh, it's a wild west uh, mentality out there. Now certainly there are ways to assure antibiotic free, non-GMO, fair trade. All of those are easily verifiable and auditable. And so there are, there are certain claims that certainly can be done. But again, if the company making those claims isn't audited, you're taking their word for it. I mentioned earlier it was important to employees and to recruits. Uh, you can see a number of uh, polls and studies that were done uh, by USA Today, Monster Track showing that it is very important amongst particularly that younger generation, uh, that generation that's coming out of school now that have really been raised on uh, climate matters and environmental matters, and they care about this very much. And of course, as we all know, the war of talent, war for talent is, is in play right now. It's tough to find employees. All of us are fighting over the same people. This will really get your company ahead if you're able to show mm -hmm. Uh, that you care and that you are disclosing your environmental social governance policies. And of course, there's always the government forcing us to do things. Um, California, of course, is always famous for uh, having a number of requirements and laws, and uh, they were one of the early ones with the Transparency and Supply Chains Act. Uh, the Dodd-Frank Act, which is a federal act on conflict mineral rules. Um, we have a number of clients that we perform procedures for related to compliance with that act. Recently, the Biden administration has noted some proposals uh, to affect sweeping financial disclosures related to 
to climate risk. And in fact, I just saw an article this week that the SEC will be uh, really looking into the transparency and source of those disclosures. Uh, and they're, they're taking an interest in the claims that publicly held companies are making in their uh, filings. There's also, of course, a lot of food packaging and food related regulations, both federal and state uh, that, that entities need to comply with. And one thing that I find um, interesting that's really hitting the financial sector is municipalities, uh, public employee retirement systems in particular, have been coming up with uh, requirements dictating green investment policies, whether that relates to certain governmental entities that they don't want invested in or um, just certain industries. Um, you look at the uh, conflict mineral rules with diamonds and where the, the sourcing is for those diamonds. And I, I just increasingly see, as because I do audit a number of public employee retirement systems for my governmental clients, um, a lot more of what you would call green investment policies that they put in place. And we're talking about a lot of money when you're looking at pension trust funds and employee benefit funds. Sorry, I didn't mean to put the, speak the little light on there. All right, well, of course, as always, there are a lot of challenges to ESG reporting. One thing that probably comes up the most often is when a company doesn't merge their financial accounting systems with their operational systems. The best way to do it is to, to merge them so that when you have a set of internal controls that, that govern your financial data, it's the same set of internal controls as over your operational data. Because if they're separate, well, now you've got two sets of internal controls that you have to deal with, and you're probably not going to put as much rigor into your ESG systems as you do your financial systems. And you'll see when Tricia and I both address this later in the presentation, it's very important to have that set of rigor. Of course, because there is no one set of reporting, it also adds to the complexity. It's great because you have a lot of choices. You can do what you want, but because there's not one set, there's also a lot of um, judgment involved. In the United States, it is still somewhat rare for a company to engage an audit firm to verify their ESG report. If you look to Europe, many parts of Asia, it's much, much more common. So again, that's a challenge because if it hasn't been verified, it hasn't been audited, you are truly trusting what that company is saying. And I'm here to tell you a lot of times companies, the information on their ESG is not coming out of their accounting records, it's coming out of their marketing department. So, I'll just say that <laughs> we're not sure about the accuracy of the numbers if they haven't been tied into the financial system. The other thing, and I don't, this isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it's a challenge in looking at a company's goals. Companies tend to report the positives, which is great, except if you set to your stakeholders that you're going to have a set of goals and here's your progress to those goals, and then you drop off anything that you didn't hit or that was negative, that's not really telling the true whole story. So we do, I do run into that a lot when I'm reading these ESG reports, is they're all very rosy. And of course, the opportunities for greenwashing. And greenwashing is a term where there's exaggeration or again, using it for marketing purposes as opposed to truly giving raw, hard data to your stakeholders. So let me turn now a little bit to more of the reporting side of this information. Of course, again, the, the triple bottom line, people, profit, planet, economic, environmental, social, and governance is, is in there as well. And again, this is, I love this slide because I think it illustrates the point that we really want to see the economic side of the reporting 
align with what's happening on the, econo on the uh, environmental and the social governance side so that it's coming from the same source, so that you can really trace that source data back to the same general ledger or the same sub-ledgers that support the general ledger. There's a lot of choices and flexibility in how a company can report on their ESG. The most, I'd say, um, strong methodology to use are the top two, either an integrated report where your financial statements and your ESG data are in the same report. Kind of stresses the importance of how the two need to really interact. But I would say it's much more common in the United States for companies to issue separate ESG or CSR sustainability reports. Um, I think there's nothing wrong with that. I think there's a lot of benefit to it because a lot of times you'll have different readers of those two sets of reports. Again, I, want, I would want to make sure that the source data comes from the same place, but it is uh, much more common again in our country to see the separate reports published. Now, I want to also mention greenhouse gas inventories or GHG, greenhouse gas emissions or carbon footprint reporting. It's really all getting back to the same thing and it's the impact of pollution or negative impacts to the environment. And I, I wanna make sure we're clear here. It's not necessarily desired that you would decrease your greenhouse gas emissions by, in the short term. I have a number of clients where just by the nature of what they do, their greenhouse gas emissions are going to go up if their sales go up. So they don't have a goal that they're gonna decrease the greenhouse gas emissions in total. They might have a goal that they're working on efficiencies to figure out how to make that equipment that makes the pollution or the product that's going into a, uh, their desired product uh, have a, less of a decrease but you don't want to necessarily have a goal that says it goes down because you don't want your sales to go down. So again, you really, the goal here isn't necessarily to say that something's going to decrease. It's going to be how do you make it more efficient or how do you get equipment? Um, the use of plastic straws is a good example. It took a while before they could, um, the technology could come up with a paper straw that didn't dissolve in your drink about halfway through it. I think they're finally there. Um, but in the, you know, in, the, in the interim time, they had to just note that they were working on it and that that was their goal. So again, I, I would make sure that you understand that the whole point of this is not necessarily always to drive down the carbon footprint or the greenhouse gas emissions, but to have goals that would say, we are working on technology that can improve this or mitigate it somehow. I also see companies that give back um, to, in, in different ways for every, you know, carbon footprint that they're hurting, they'll have, you know, for, for a station planted. So they have things that they'll do carbon credits to make up for the pollution they're doing. So those are the types of things that we'll be seeing in these greenhouse gas emission reports. Just, I just wanted to make sure you understood it wasn't, I'm not up here advocating that you, you know, decrease every bit of impact that you have on the environment. It's really looking at what you're doing, taking an inventory of it, and then how are you going to work towards reducing that in the future at, the, at a time that technology may catch up with you. We also see um, a lot of code of conduct or supply chain reports. Uh, these are not as frequently verified as uh, the top three are, um, but again, important information to your stakeholders. Of course, you can go on your website and make a lot of claims and assertions. It's a step. Um, sometimes in information like that isn't always verifiable um, if it's not in a you know, full report that has a set of internal control structure behind it, for example. Um, product certifications. We do use a lot of product certifications in our procedures that we perform over greenhouse gas emissions, for example. So that is an important part of reporting. And of course, people can make claims in all kinds of marketing materials that come out for their company. And I'm not saying, again, I'm not downgrading or downplaying that this is not important, but again, there's a difference between that and something that's in a report that can actually be verified by a CPA.
I mentioned one of the standards, or one of the challenges, is there isn't one set of standards. And here is just a laundry list of some of the standards and criteria that are out there today. Um, Global Reporting Initiative has been around a long, long time. Uh, they have a number of uh, frameworks and standards and sample um, key performance indicators that companies in all kinds of industries can use. SASB uh, started here in the United States, uh, has a good framework and again, other um, examples of criteria that companies can use. The IIRC, International Integrated Reporting uh, Council, uh, recently actually merged with SASB to form the Value Reporting Foundation. Uh, what's great about this is there's still the frameworks from each of the two kind of parent organizations, but now they have banded together to really be a one-stop shopping uh, for the framework and for the KPI examples and the criteria that companies can use. That just happened a couple of months ago. Now, again, the U.S. lags behind the rest of the, a lot of the rest of the world as far as uh, having reporting standards and criteria. So if you go to some of the countries I've noted here, you will see that they have their own reporting and criteria that they expect the companies that are headquartered in their countries to use. Carbon Disclosure Project is a um, entity where you can submit your greenhouse gas emissions report and it gets graded and they give you feedback on how it can be made better. They actually award points uh, based on what's covered in the report. So a, a lot of food and beverage clients uh, do file their reports with CDP. I would say the most common though, especially amongst my client base that have been doing this for decades, they develop their own criteria. Now that's not to say they might not check GRI or SASB and get some ideas on what they might want to put in their report. But you know, you know your own company the best. And so for you to come up with your own goals, you know what's important to your own stakeholders, that is a very accepted methodology in the world of ESG, is to develop your own criteria that you're in your own goals that you'll hold yourself accountable for. Just a final word on the carbon footprint. Uh, this is becoming more and more common, especially as people realize the impact of climate change and the impact of the emissions that companies are having onto our, our climate. Um, there's just a way to uh, really explain to your stakeholders what you're planning on doing about it. And again, not an apology for what you're doing to create your product, but your goals in the future as to how you can lessen that impact. I'll certainly say, coming from Seattle, we had um, three days in June, right in a row, over 100 degrees, with the hottest one being 109. There have only been five days over 100 degrees in the entire history of recording temperatures in the Seattle area. And you might be just rolling your eyes at me right now, but we don't have air conditioning in our homes in Seattle. So that was miserable. So I think there were some people that like, oh, I, th I think there is some climate change going on here. How's, what is happening? And there was a really big demand for putting air conditioning in our homes after that, I can tell you that. But um, there, there, that's been just a, a very prevalent topic uh, amongst companies now as far as how can they start tracking uh, their impact on their greenhouse gas emissions and you know, what that looks like to their stakeholders. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Tricia, who's going to give you the scoop on the challenges of actually putting these ESG reports together. Hey, I just keep thinking about the air conditioning thing and I'm one of the few folks that have air conditioning in Seattle. So I was sitting in a sweater while other people were on the line sweating. So that I'm was me and I didn't house. feel bad about it. I'm gonna come to your house. At all, did not feel bad about it at all. Um, my role with the firm is I lead our uh, inclusion and social responsibility efforts. So I work really closely with our inclusion and diversity advisory board and with the Moss Adams Foundation. And so my role with them is to help them determine their strategy and execute on that as well. And so I will go through our own experience in reporting 
and also go through you know, just some basic things that we need to be thinking about as we're doing the, going through the reporting process. So there's five different factors that we need to think about when we're reporting. One of them is deciding on a framework. You saw the list of all the different types of frameworks and all the different types of reporting that you can do. Um, the key is really getting that framework together because it could be overwhelming. You could report on hundreds and hundreds of pieces of data, but really try and decide what is the right framework for you and your organization. You also have to define goals. So this report is also showing what, do you, what are you doing as an organization? What steps are you taking? And what are your goals to meet those, those? What actions are you taking to meet those goals? The other key thing is thinking about what is the connection to your business strategy? So always be thinking about what's important to your stakeholders. What are you doing from an operational perspective? How can you build that into what you're doing from an ESG perspective as well? The internal control structure. I think that's something that is very, very important. Lori talked about this, how you should have that connection to the, your financial reporting and making sure that you know, this matches everything else that you're putting out there. And then also just being consistent. I think one of the things that, you, two things that you need to think about is one, are you regularly reporting? So if you commit to annual reporting, you better annually report your, your information. And two, you know, is it consistent with everything else that you're reporting as well? So deciding on a framework, one of the first steps that we did at Moss Adams when we started to report, started our CSR report is we actually put together a CSR board. And so we put together all the stakeholders that we knew, hey, these are the things that we might want to report on. Who are the kind of the key players in those areas? So Lori was one of them since she works a lot on the client facing side on ESG reporting. We had people, people leaders involved in that as well. We had our real estate people, we had our travel people. So we had to bring a number of different folks together that would be responsible for that. Um, we also had to just start thinking about what's important to the firm. What are we going to report on? And you know, we started off using the GRI um, metrics as well. And it can be overwhelming. Like if you hop on that site, lots and lots of examples. But it's a good way to start on you know, how do we want to do this? You know, for us, when we first launched our first CSR report, it was focused on the environment, our people, and the community. And we've stayed true to that over the last, you know, 10, almost 10 years that we've been reporting on this. Um, and then one of the things that Lori had talked about is that, yes, we use some of the GRI reporting standards, but we also came up with some of our own criteria as well. So the key performance indicators, I think this is super important for us to be thinking about when you are reporting, um, making sure that it ties to the organization, again, your strategy. But what we like to do with it, too, is say, hey, you know, here are the things that we're going to be measuring, and what's our plan? You know, If we have this goal, and this is what we're trying to achieve, what action steps are we going to be taking? So um, one of the things that we wanted to be really focused on is you know, being realistic also about what our goals and what we're going to achieve and making sure it actually matches what our plan is. So this last year, we've been working with the foundation, or I've been working with the foundation to refresh our strategy. And one of the things that we've been focused on, we were calling it our key north metrics, our key north measures. And so we, in each one of the areas that we're focused on, so we refreshed our strategy, we're focused on social equity, we're focused on education, and then we're also focused on the community. We developed, hey, in each one of those buckets, what are we trying, what's our overall goal? And then we started to track, okay, 2022, what are we gonna try to hit? 23, 24, 25. And then backing into that, then we said, okay, here's what we currently do. What do we need to change? What more do we need to do to be able to hit our metrics there as well? So when we look at different examples of KPIs, you know, here's the list of all of those different things. You know, each organization, each industry is going to have something different that they're reporting on. You know, for us, it was really important from an environmental side of let's take a look at, you know, are we looking at recycled products? Um, how much are our people traveling? You know, one of the things that came up when we were looking at our metrics was, you know, this was six months ago, so by that point we were at home working virtually for the last 12 months. And we learned pretty quickly that we can be effective working virtually. 
So one of the things that we knew was that eventually we are going to be back traveling again, case in point. Lori and I here today traveling here from Seattle and trying to make sure we find the opportunities where it was important for us to be in front of clients, to be face to face with people. So one of the things that we're looking at right now is, you know, with all of our travel, do we need to start putting some guidance in place and saying, here are the opportunities that we think are valuable for you to be in person, here are opportunities for you that make sense for you to do virtually and what that would look like. So even just going through the KPI process has helped us identify action items that we need to be focused on. Well, and Tricia, I, I would just add too, um, travel is a great example of what I was talking about earlier. We didn't want to have a KPI that said we wanted to reduce travel. I mean, we want more clients, right? And we want more clients all around the United States. And we supply specialists to those clients, and they're not always the ones sitting right in the office next to their, in their own city. And so we developed a KPI that just said, well, we're, we're going to look at how to make our travel more efficient. Maybe we will use airlines that have a commitment towards uh, using uh, you know, less emissions? Um, can we somehow bundle our travel? Uh, do we have meetings internally that we could try to uh, make it? Well, now we, we're experts at doing this virtual thing, but at that time we didn't, we weren't. And so just all those types of things, but it was never a KPI of ours that we were going to reduce our client travel. That, that was not the point. It was how do we make our travel count more and how do we use service providers in travel that that are looking towards less environmental stress. So just yeah. wanted to add that. Yeah, other things that we are looking at too is, you know, as we went through a whole real estate strategy where we were moving into new buildings and doing new build outs. So, you know, do we have the opportunity to be in a lead building? That might be one of the criteria that we're looking at. You know, other things that we did during some of our remodels was as simple as like, we got rid of paper plates, plastic cups, and we all have we have real silverware, real plates, and those get washed every day. So that was one way that we were also reducing waste as well. When we think about social, this is a huge part for our firm because you know we're all about people. You know, people are our product. So we're focused on two things. One, what are we doing internally? And then what are we doing externally? So internally, we were really looking at, you know, what type of benefits are we providing our people? You know, what type of healthcare insurance? What type of parental leave? You know, are we looking at gender pay, our gender pay gap? That's something that we do, we've been doing for years and years and years, doing equity audits on pay. Um, part of um, just employee retention, and especially now in this space where we are fighting for talent and having a diverse workforce is also important to us. So we're looking at, you know, what are, what are the programs that we're doing to increase retention? You know, what are, how are we tracking retention across women, across um, people of different racial and ethnicities? So that's something that we're really focused on. We're developing strategies with that as well. And things that we're doing externally, that's very focused on what the Moss Adams Foundation is all about. So we're focused on, you know, how are we giving back to the communities around us? Are people volunteering in the community? How much money are we giving to the universities that we recruit from, from the different um, nonprofits that are in our, in our areas? We also give diversity scholarships. So those are all things that we can track and report on to demonstrate our commitment to um, our communities and to our people. From a governance perspective, this is something that we've been reporting on since I started at Moss Adams. I started back in 13 years ago, 13 plus years ago, and my first role was starting our women's initiative for MW. So that was really focused on how can we retain, advance, and develop women within our firm and within public accounting. And so our very first report in 2009, after a year of our efforts there, we started reporting on the number of women partners we had in the firm, the number of women that are sitting on the executive committee, um, the number of women in all of our different levels to really track and see how are we doing. We also use that as an opportunity to start to set short-term, mid-term, and long-term goals on you know, what is our goal for women in public accounting. Here we have just things that we're starting to see in terms of trends in reporting. So definitely seeing a higher, a um, lot more reports focused on environment and greenhouse emission, greenhouse um, gases, gas emissions. Um, you're starting to see more and more inclusion and diversity as part of that reporting. 
as well. Um, what are we doing to de develop people within organizations to have, you know, retain diversity and then also make an inclusive environment within companies? Um, taking a bold stand on what you're going to do. I think you've probably heard a number of companies that are going to say we're going to be, you know, carbon neutral within the next 10 years. You know, those are things that you're starting to see people wanting to be bold about what their plans are. Um, one thing that I think is important and, you know, one of the things that we're focused on is like, how do we also inspire our own people and our clients on what we're doing and hopefully inspire others as well is we're starting to really look at the human element. You can report all the numbers. You can have reports that have all that information. But one thing that we'd like to do is say, what is the true impact? Can we tell stories about ways that we've been able to make an impact on the communities or people that we've, let's say, given scholarships to? You know, what have they done with their scholarship? Are they becoming, you know, Moss Adams employees, but really trying to get to that human element? And in terms of just reporting, you know, we have lots of reports that are just PDFs. And with changes in technology and the way that we can analyze data and visualize data, you're starting to see more interactive reports on different websites. You can start to play around with the different visualizations. So I think that's another way to really engage people externally on what you're doing. And then the other piece is just the sustainable development goals. So there's now goals that people are looking at across the world that they're all starting to say, hey, we're gonna also jump and be part of that, that global sustainability effort as well. So in terms of just defining goals and measurement systems, you know, developing short-term and long-term goals are very, very important. So what are you planning to do this year next year and the following years. You know, how are you gonna meet those goals? So even when we were brainstorming what we're gonna be doing, you know, we had to be very realistic about, you know, here's what we want to achieve. How are we gonna make those incremental steps to be able to achieve that? And how are we gonna measure those? You know, what, what reporting systems are we gonna have? Who's in charge of measuring that? Those are all things that you need to be thinking about. Um, one of the things that we need to focus on, especially when we did our first CSR report, is like, who's responsible? So, you know, one of the things that, you know, just like any other business function, there's someone who's accountable for something. And so that's how we looked at our reporting as well from a CSR perspective or ESG perspective. Someone's on point. Someone needs to be in charge of that. So, you know, for our real estate, um, our real estate, our carbon footprint, we looked at, you know, our real estate person. He's the one that's coming up with the metrics and reporting to us and making sure that, you know, we are following those rules. And then also we have multiple layers of review as well. So we have the board, we have different key stakeholders that are making sure that our data is accurate. And demonstrating connection. I know Lori had talked about this earlier, but really thinking about, you know, reporting everything that you're doing from an ESG perspective should tie to what your business goals are and what your strategy is. So at Moss Adams, we put out a, a five-year strategy that goes till 2025, and there's a couple strategies that are important to us. One of them was being focused on the community and our, our environmental responsibilities, and one of them is to be an anti-racist firm. So if the firm puts out that that's the strategy, you know, I have the foundation working on how are we gonna meet those strategies and those goals, and I have our inclusion and diversity advisory board pulling together, okay, what are we planning to do? Because that, that is a strategy that we're focused on and we have to report on that and we do that every year. Also, what other stakeholders are you thinking about? Lori talked about our recruits. This is a huge, huge deal for us. You know, we do a lot of campus recruiting and we're hearing from our recruits that you know, they want to know about what we're doing from an IND perspective. How diverse is the firm? They want to know how we're giving back to, to the communities. So it ends up being a really good tool to have this report to be able to share, hey, here's everything that we're doing as well. I also hear from our internal employees, you know, communication is tough across the firm. And someone who sits in my seat that knows everything that's happening, from a CSR perspective or an environment perspective and an IND perspective, I'm like, oh, everyone should know what we're working on and all the programs that we're doing. And we communicate it, we write articles, we send emails. 
And so this is just a great way to be able to share with clients, with recruits, with your own employees and say, hey, here's all the wonderful things that we're doing. Also, here are the things that we aren't doing so well and need to improve upon. And the internal control structure, back to what Lori was saying, was just making sure that you know, whatever you report has to tie back to something. Best practice, again, is that it ties to your financial reporting as well. And then making sure that we have people that are actually monitoring um, progress, monitoring the reporting, and making sure what you're putting out there is um, consistent. And then again, the consistency piece. Something that we have been committed to and has actually helped us stay accountable, of course, on everything that we've um, been working on in this space was that we, we do annual reports every single year. So that's, that's been two things. One, you know, it's a transparency on our side, but then it also motivates us to say like, hey, if we're gonna have to put a report out, we better have something to say and show that we've demonstrated progress. So that also pushes us a little bit um, going forward. And then, you know, Lori had talked about greenwashing. You know, we don't want to start just pulling out metrics because it doesn't look good this year. So I think it's really being really consistent year over year on reporting the goals that you've set out and how are you achieving those goals until you say, you know, this was our goal till 2025, report on that till 2025 and demonstrate how you're achieving that. And so this is kind of the history of Moss Adams ESG reporting. You can see back in 2009 was when we first published our first women's initiative, our Anna report. 2012 is when we issued our first CSR report. And through time, it's kind of evolved. You know, now we publish our Moss Adams Foundation report that talks about all the different things that we're doing from a social equity, environmental, and community perspective. And then we have our inclusion and diversity report that has talks about all the program that we need that we do, we have our headcount numbers in there, we have our turnover numbers in there, we have our promotion rates in there, all of our hiring statistics, and some are good, some are bad, but we've made a commitment to be transparent on providing that information. And, you know, every year, you know, we still wanna be consistent, but there's also that opportunity to evolve and get better. So, you know, this last year, yep, we increased transparency on some of our metrics. You know, we also want to be able to tell the story about what we're doing. And part of that is looking back. So that's what these reports are all about, right? Looking back, checking progress, but also giving, um, giving insight into where you're going. And then I think the key piece is just reinforcing the messaging across our own company with your clients, with your recruits on, you know, this is what we're all about and this is what we're trying to achieve. And I'm going to hand it back to Lori to talk about assurance in ESG reports. Thank you. All right. Well, we're nearing the last part of our presentation here. I'm going to spend the last bit talking about assurance reports and why are CPAs involved in this in the first place? Well, there are a number of different parties that could claim uh, verification of data. I put the CPAs at the top. Um, we do follow a framework, whether that's generally accepted auditing standards or international auditing and assurance standards board standards. Um, and most frequently when we are asked to verify an ESG or a CSR report, we do structure that as an attest engagement, an examination, which is an audit or a review. So you're getting a, a framework that the financial community is very, very familiar with. Now, there's also companies that are not CPAs that I'm gonna call them industrial compliance firms. I'm not sure if I made up that term or I just heard it somewhere, but that's kind of what I've been using over the years. And most commonly, I see examples of this in um, food manufacturers or really just kind of any manufacturing type of company or pr production. And these are companies that will come into your warehouse and they will check to see that the, there's a number of exits that are required by the um, governmental entity. Uh, are there the appropriate amount of fire extinguishers? They may look at personnel records to determine 
uh, certain criteria such as immigration status, for example. And what they will do is then, after the results of their procedures, they will provide a pass or fail uh, grade. And oftentimes, the client, the auditee, um, or rather, the, the client may not be the auditee. So that warehouse that they're inspecting, they may be doing that at the behest of someone else, perhaps somebody up, up the supply chain or some other interested third party. Um, so you're not really getting um, an attestation or a verification of any type of report necessarily, but it's really a step that's showing that a certain factory might be in compliance with certain criteria. There's also quite commonly, and you'll see this in a number of ESG reports, is an expert panel or an expert third party opinion where somebody comes in and discusses uh, the criteria that were used in the report, perhaps the adequacy of that criteria. It's, it's usually someone that's immersed in that industry that knows that industry and they're billing them as sort of an independent person coming in to, to offer their um, opinion on the content of their ESG report. So again, not a verification of the actual results, but more of an evaluation of what the content is in that report. And I have a couple examples of this to show you. So I just pulled off their website um, two companies, both very well known, highly regarded for being longtime uh, publishers of ESG or CSR data, the leaders in their industry with respect to uh, making um, goals and KPIs and then reporting on their progress. So I pulled each of these off of the websites noted here. Let's look first at the uh, Starbucks report. And as noted in the website, they refer to the independent accountants report in their actual global sustainability report. And I'm going to go through the, you're not expected to read this, by the way, even those of you in the front. Um, I put it up here just for example. Uh, but this is a standard audit opinion. I think those of you that are familiar with financial statement audit opinions will find it very familiar. I'll go through the uh, sections of this in just a moment. But the key sentence at the end, in our opinion, uh, the data on the pages listed um, are fairly presented in relation to the criteria identified. So it is an audit opinion, very, very similar to a financial statement opinion. Contrast that with the Subaru report where they have chosen to use um, a third party opinion, that's what they're calling it. Um, this is a specialist in the, their field who has written a lot of words about how uh, the criteria that they chose for their report appears to be adequate. Uh, gave a couple of recommendations here on criteria that they might want to include in a future report. And then the company says, well, thank you very much for coming in. You were very kind. And yes, we will consider your recommendations. So it's valid, you know, it's very valid. It's probably very helpful. They're getting some input on the content mm -hmm. of their report. But my fear is I hope nobody thinks that was an audit. I hope nobody thinks that was somehow a verification that the data is accurate because that's not what he did. So there is a, a big difference between a company that's getting an audit of their data and a company that's using other types of verification methods, again, that might not have anything to do with the accuracy of the data. So I hope I don't have to explain to this group, but there is a lot of value to external assurance. Uh, it certainly increases your accountability to your stakeholders. It is gonna measure um, how well that company is living up to its values. When you see a CPA giving their opinion that the data is accurate, you know they've done a lot of work behind that statement. Um, it's also a way to discourage the greenwashing that's going on uh, in every industry. 
Also, if you're a company that wants to submit your report to an entity like CDP, Carbon Disclosure Project, they do give additional points. This almost bounces you up into that upper category if your report has been reviewed. So it's not widely known, I, I'm trying to make it my personal mission to make it more widely known, that CPA firms do this work. We can issue audit reports, review reports on ESG reports. And we can do that in many forms. We can do it with your integrated report, if, especially if we're already doing your financial statement audit, just throw it in there. Um, typically, most of my clients, as I mentioned earlier, do issue separately issued ESG reports. So we come in when they're almost done with their data gathering, they're at the point where they're about to publish the information, that's at the time when we'll come in to do field work. We're also able to issue verification on code of conduct or um, supply chain procedures as well. I've also done a lot of consulting projects with supply chain where we take a product or um, a food product, we, we take the ingredients out, it's almost like a, like a giant family tree, take the food product, the ingredients, then you take the next set of ingredients and until you get down to the seed if you're trying to determine if something is organic or GMO or, or no antibiotics in the, in the source product. Um, always very interesting. It's tough to, uh, to get away from any type of uh, growth hormones in any of our products, I'll just put it that way. And, and a lot of companies will get down to a certain level and then we have to sign non-disclosure agreements or they absolutely actually refuse to let us in to look at their documents. And of course, then we'll go back to the company that hired us and say, well, we took it as far as we could and they barred us entry even though your lawyer told them that we could come in. So a lot of very interesting um, pro uh, projects come out of supply chain work and then product certifications as well. So again, um, we perform examinations under the attestation standards. An uh, examination is akin to an audit. For, we are also, um, I do a lot of reviews and it's just a you know, little bit lesser of a level of assurance. It sometimes does lend itself better to sometimes a lot of food products, for example. And I would also say most, if not all, I've never seen one not done this way, greenhouse gas emission reports are reviewed. And that's just because of the inherent uncertainty of a lot of the engineering estimates that go into the calculation of the emissions. So you're gonna see most likely uh, that if it's a, a GH, uh, GHG report is out there, if it's been verified, it's most likely going to be a review, not an examination. The report um, when we issue uh, an examination is exactly the same as a report that we issue for an audit client of financial statements. It's gonna be addressed to the stakeholder. It's gonna identify the scope. It's gonna identify the criteria. So instead of following Financial Accounting Standards Board, FASB or GASB, maybe they followed GRI. Maybe they followed their own company criteria. And then optional, uh, you can identify in your report the procedures that you performed. Sometimes that makes it a little bit more clear to the reader who might not be used to reading audit reports or they're a little confused about how you could have done an audit on those KPIs. So we do have a lot of instances where we actually put the procedures that we performed in our audit opinion report. And then the last sentence, that last paragraph is your opinion. Review, again, very similar. Um, oh, I wanted to back up a little bit too. Um, I get a lot of questions on this, so I'll, I'll um, fend it off right now. You know, how do, you know, what does your audit binder look like? How do you do an audit of KPIs and ESG stuff? And you know, it looks exactly the same. We have a planning section in our binder. We do risk assessment. We identify the key internal controls. We test the reliability of those key internal controls. If we can rely on them, that will lessen our substantive procedures that we have to do at year, at year end or after the, the 
a period is over. And then we um, make sure there's no exceptions and, and decide that you know, we can issue that unqualified opinion. So it is um, ex exactly like a financial statement audit. It, the bind our binder, our work papers, everything looks almost identical. It's just that instead of payroll, you're auditing the system of social and inclusion diversity or whatever that KPI is that the company is putting into their report. Review, again, very similar. Um, you're gonna be at least identifying, you might not have to test all the internal controls or review is a little bit less than an audit in as far as rigor, uh, but we certainly would want those identified to make sure they're operating as designed. Um, we would certainly interview key individuals. We're gonna obtain policies and procedures, certain tests performed on a, on a test basis. Again, enough to get the evidence to issue that review report that we're comfortable with. This page I've left for you for just the, the web pages that I think would be very interested, interesting to you. These are the entities we've been mentioning throughout our talk uh, so far today. Um, there's a wealth of information in each of these and, and it doesn't stop here. I could have probably added 10 more. Um, there's this just is a burgeoning uh, interest in all things ESG. So it's, it's a wonderful time for me to see because I, I've been uh, performing audits and reviews of clients in this area for the past 20 years, and it was much more rare uh, back then. So to see it coming uh, to this level where there's a lot more interest is, is gratifying. So with that, Tricia and I are available for questions. I think we have probably 12, 13 minutes um, for questions, and we'd love to hear from you. Oh, back in the back, sir. I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Oh, and the question was, do we use glass door ratings as a considering factor? That's we a have question an, more for you, probably. Yeah, because that's more <laughs> focus on employee, like, employees' opinions about the Moss Adams. We haven't use that in the past. One thing that we've done internally is that we also run employee engagement surveys or employee surveys. We've used some of that data to report on, you know, how, you know, our companies feel like their experiences at the firm. So, I mean, Glassdoor, there's positive and negatives, but I think we, we do our own surveys internally to temperature check our employees. Take Carolyn, and then there's a question there. Go ahead. One question I had asked earlier, and Lori said it was for the Q and A session, so I'll ask it now. Is um, there are a lot of companies that are moving towards ESG, but they're starting. They're not fully there. They're probably not ready for an audit. They didn't want to have the team come out that oh, well, we're this far along. So, what do you advise them? Are they not sure how much is going to go there? Sure. Okay. So I'll repeat the question. Um, she is wondering if there's a lot of companies probably out there that would like to do more in the field of ESG reporting. Maybe they're just getting started. They certainly don't want to have an auditor come in right away when they're first starting. And so what is the advice for that sort of company? And yes, I think um, you do need a couple of years under your belt. I think just figuring out what your KPIs are going to be, what is your internal control structure that leads up to that? Because it doesn't really do a lot of good to engage an auditor and then find out, okay, nothing's reliable in your system. So it's probably best to wait until you've really got that set up. Now, the great thing is you don't have to do it all by yourself. There are, you know, certainly CPA firms are able to assist with that internal control setup. Um, there's also consulting firms that specialize in ESG matters that are very good at, at knowing, okay, what does that data have to look like to be able to be compiled into reports? So you don't have to do it on your own. There are a lot of companies out there that can assist with the consulting side of getting it started. But I, I would recommend, you know, make sure you've got a really good system in place before you subject it to a review or an audit, or, or you, you may be in the situation where your auditor has to step aside while you get some things fixed. Um, 
I'll never, I know for that some of my clients back in the early years doing this, we would see ESG reports or back then they were called CSR reports and they would just be voluminous and it became just extremely difficult to have a system that you know, processed all that information into the data and it was really going into a lot of detail. So I really started being able to advise my clients like figure out what is important to your stakeholders and focus on that. You don't have to report on, you know, you can report on a lot of things, but maybe you don't have to have everything audited. Maybe you just want the most important components uh, in your scope for your review or for your audit. So that's, that's something that we've kind of come to over the years. And I've just, I've seen it ebb and flow where companies will have like really long reports on everything and then they do narrow it down and then maybe the year after that they'll come up with some more. I think that's all fine as long as you don't drop things that were in part of your long-term strategy. You don't want to see it going, oh, we tossed that out this year because the results weren't very good and so we'll put it back in when it's good again. I mean, you really have to guard against that. That gets back to the consistency that, that Tricia was talking about. But I think I probably talked more than your question asked, but, <laughs> and I think there was a question here. So let me repeat the question, but I'm not sure I know what it means. You want to know what a client would do if they're not in tune with our own Moss Adams philosophy? So if we have a stakeholder that's not in line, um, and you're talking specifically about Moss Adams. Yes, uh, true, true, right, yep. Yep. Right. So the question is, what would we do about a client if they maybe didn't buy into what we're saying is important to us in our ESG report that we're putting out? Um, I would just say, and I'll speak for Moss Adams, I think, I don't know if your question was more generic, but um, you know, I think companies, when they put out these types of reports, they are planting a flag in the ground saying, this is what we stand for, and this is what we're gonna report on, and these are our goals. Um, certainly, we know we can't please every st stakeholder, um, but we're showing the world who we are, and what we stand for, and what our goals are, and. I guess in that situation, the client would have to decide, wow, that doesn't fit what I believe in, so I'm probably not going to use your services. I mean, that, that, you know, we're just, we are being transparent. This is who we are. The question was, has Moss Adams ever fired a client because they have not been consistent with our objectives? No, not directly. We are certainly saying what we're standing for. We don't expect our clients to be exactly like us or follow everything we say, certainly. Um, we do you know, draw the lines at how clients treat our people when they're out in their offices. There's codes of professional behavior and that sort of thing. But no, we do not ask clients, you know, do you believe in our framework or our, our uh, reports that we're putting out? That, that's really just, it's on us and we're publishing it. And you know we have thousands and thousands and thousands of clients, all who have different lines of business and views and you know, we respect diversity. Question. Yes. 
Right, and good question. Why the G? Why the governance? Is, is governance wrapped up in environmental and social? And you know, it really is. So that's why a lot of times you won't see the G in the triple people, planet, profit types of models. But I think that it's really been gaining its own prominence in the past few years because of you know, looking at, all right, board of directors makeup. Is that board of directors you know, racially diverse uh, women? Uh, there's been just a lot of attention paid to that. Uh, senior executives, um, are they behind um, the, the policies and procedures? What is the compensation level? Sometimes that gets, comes into play. And so there's just been an increased um, spotlight, if you will, on boards and on senior executives in the past few years. And I think that's what gave rise to governance kind of being its own category. But you are very correct, it is intertwined with social and with environmental, because that is the group that's setting those policies. So it is hard to separate that sometimes. Any like we have four questions? more minutes. All right, well I think we're nearing the end of our time. I don't know if anyone had any last comments. Oh, there is one more in the back here. Yes, sir. Um, the question was, am I aware of any um, actions by the SEC against any um, ESG reports? I, I personally am not aware of any. I do know just from what I've read in the past week that they're, that they're going to be more interested in making sure the accuracy of those claims, when they look at that integrated report, if there's ESG claims in there, they're starting to pay a lot more attention to it. So I wouldn't be surprised if we start seeing more noise coming out of that. That seems to be the way that they're going. And just the fact that, you know, you look around the rest of the world and they are doing much more in the way of integrated reporting, where the ESG report is part next, right next to the financial statement reporting. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised to see it go in that direction. I personally am not aware of uh, any rulings or actions taken. That doesn't mean there haven't been any, but I'm not aware of any. Okay. Thank you. And we will be around for the uh, networking. Thanks to Trisha and Lori and, and Moss Adams for an enlightening presentation, and we are adjourned to the social hour. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining the webinar. I did put the link in for the next uh, keynote speaker session that starts at 7 o'clock Central. Feel free to click that link or copy and paste it. Yeah. Me. And we'll see you. Done.